The United States Supreme Court just issued a major decision by an eight to one vote. The court upheld a federal statute that temporarily disarmed individuals subjected to a domestic violence restraining order. You had Justice Clarence Thomas dissenting. I want to bring in Mike Sachs, senior advisor to court accountability and now also an advisor to Midas Touch on all things United States Supreme Court. So welcome to the Midas Touch Network. One point about Mike as well. He was a classmate of mine at Georgetown Law, so it's great to have you on the network. Can you break down the Rahimi decision uh, as well as it in the context of the Supreme Court's other uh, gun jurisprudence? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ben. So. Rahimi is, in essence, a cleanup on aisle originalism. Now, a couple of years ago, the Supreme Court uh, issued a decision striking down a 100 or so old gun restriction in New York State, uh, New York City, rather, saying that any gun restriction across the land uh, to be constitutional must have some analogous connection to restrictions that were in place either in 1791 when the, when the Second Amendment was ratified, or 1868 when the 14th Amendment, which makes the Second Amendment applicable to the states, when that was ratified. And this is a history and tradition test that was vigorously uh, uh, protested by the dissenters in the, Bruin, in the Bruin case. That was the name of the case uh, from 2022. Uh, after the Bruin case, a whole bunch of challenges came forward against various state and federal laws, to assault weapons bans, to uh, bans on felons carrying guns, and also then to this one uh, federal law that was at issue in this case, uh, that was a, a, a guy who was under protective order for domestic abuse, domestic violence, wanted his guns back because the federal government said you can't have guns. And he said, that's against my Second Amendment rights. There is no history or tradition of people like me being stripped of our guns because back at founding or at, at reconstruction, well, domestic violence wasn't a thing that was, that was prohibited. And the Fifth Circuit, which is a very extreme right wing court based out of, out of New Orleans, which covers Mississippi, Texas and Louisiana, said, you're right, guy. Uh, we look at Bruin, we look at this six to three supermajority decision uh, talking about history and tradition written by Justice Clarence Thomas. And we agree, you should get your guns back because there was no history or tradition of disarming people under protective order for domestic violence back then. Well, this was something this, this Supreme Court probably didn't anticipate coming back to them when they decided Bruin. And so today in this Rahimi case, that was the name of the person who was trying to get his gun back. Uh, the Supreme Court by an eight to one vote with the author Bruin, Clarence Thomas, as the one dissenter because the rest of the justices who were part of that supermajority in Bruin said no. We don't want to touch this. This is bad optics. We don't want to look as though we're enabling domestic violence, uh, people under protective order for, for domestic violence to continue their violence with a, with a weapon, with a, with a firearm. It was a pretty wild decision. Um, as I said, it was eight to one. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion, conducting cleanup on aisle originalism and distancing his right wing supermajority on the Supreme Court from the even more right wing majority on the Fifth Circuit, saying, no, we're, we're not like those crazies. We're 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 down the middle here. We're not going to give guns back to domestic to domestic abusers. And he was joined by Justice Thomas, Justice Samuel Alito. He was joined by all three Trump justices, Justice Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, each of whom concurred separately. We can get into that as well. And also joined by the three liberal uh, Democratic appointees, uh, Justices Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Kintanji Brown Jackson. Now those three also each wrote to say, no, we still don't agree with Bruin. We still don't agree with this history and tradition test. We still don't even agree, perhaps even with the Second Amendment cases that came before it, that, de that declared an individual right to keep and bear arms for self-defense that came in the Heller case in 2008. Nor did we perhaps even agree with the McDonald case that came in 2010, which extended that to the states. But we're gonna focus on Bruin here and say, we still don't agree with it, but as we're applying the history and tradition test in this current case, we apply it correctly and more plastically, more pliably than how the Bruin majority seemed to seemed to have dictated it to the lower courts. Now, Mike, one of the things idea, that yeah. you've 
what one of the things that you've been very focused on at court accountability is the timing of these cases how you will get a decision like we had last week in garland versus cargill which basically says bum stocks are not machine guns and so bum stocks are permitted which was by all accounts, I thought an outrageous decision that was authored by Justice Clarence Thomas. So you have a proliferation of bump stocks. Okay, the, they know that the Supreme Court knows, the right wing Supreme Court knows there's gonna be this public reaction to that. And then though they try to tone it down yeah. by taking another fairly extreme ruling from the Fifth Circuit involving a domestic violence statute and say you know what domestic but but we're not going to give the guns to people who have domestic violence restraining orders right like we're cool we're, we're, we're not that extreme after making an extreme decision so that's one mm -hmm. of the things you focus on right at the corner accountability project is the timing of these things are not by accident no none of this is by accident the supreme court can design its own docket pick and choose the case it, the cases it wants to take up to set an agenda and this term is very much about the Roberts Court, led by Chief Justice John Roberts, trying to wrest control from from the justices who seem to run away with the court, the other the other term, the Dobbs term and the Bruin term, uh, and say, no, we want to get some headlines uh, declaring that we are, after all, not so bad. We are pretty moderate. We're not so anti-democratic. We're not trying to seize the entire control of the federal government under our own uh, under our, our own power. Uh, so you'll see that across all sorts of issue areas this term. Uh, as you mentioned, with the bump stock case, uh, the court did say that the bump stock ban uh, put forward by uh, the Trump administration was beyond the federal government's power to regulate. And in this case, the Supreme Court said, but the Second Amendment does not forbid the government from uh, disarming someone under protective order for domestic violence. It's a win one, lose one situation that they're going to be doing across every pretty much every issue area that comes before the court this term and they've already begun doing that uh it's very much an image management thing uh, but it's also uh some 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 cases come to them that they just you know, have to take whether there's a split in the circuits or a lower court like the fifth circuit struck down a, a federal regulation or an act of congress or an executive order uh, so the story of this term is very much clean up on aisle fifth circuit uh, across a whole array, array of issues. You saw it with the abortion pill case. You're seeing it with uh, the Rahimi case. Uh, but also um, it's it's to design a docket to ensure that the big swings they take for uh, for their Republican co-partisans and for the, for the right-wing legal movement over the course of several decades is counterbalancing the headlines by, by uh, pulling back the excesses and the bad optics that are coming out of the courts that are full on YOLO MAGA courts below. You know, when you think about the uh, test, whether or not there should be even restrictions on firearms that was announced in the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin case. So we talk about the Bruin case decided in 2022 that Justice Clarence Thomas authored. The test is, does any specific restriction, quote, fit within, this is what you were talking about, fit within our nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. And so when Justice Clarence Thomas and the right wing court announces that test, they could basically come out with any outcome that they want based yeah. on their selective reading of history. Yep. So it is a kind of heads I win, tails you lose, no matter what we want the outcome to be, all we have to do is say, it does or doesn't fit within our nation's mm -hmm. historical tradition based on the selective reading of history of a right-wing court. So they've created a test to always reverse engineer outcomes Correct. that they want. And it's it's we're seeing the, the, that come up in different uh, circumstances. I'll give you the final word on, on this one, but it's great to have you on the network really getting into the weeds of these Supreme Court cases. Final word on this case. Well. It's another display of how originalism is bunk, right? It's put forward as this one true way to dispassionately understand the Constitution and its provisions as applied to the people and our rights. But it's just another means for result-oriented judging that the people who put forward originalism say they're against. But we're seeing it in full force now. You saw 
all three Trump ju justices who proclaim to be originalists taking to their own concurrences in this opinion, saying, but no, I have it right. No, I have it right. No, I have it right. While Justice Clarence Thomas in dissent, again, the author of the Bruin opinion that this case was interpreting, said, no, what I said was what was was what originalism does demand. And it demands that domestic abusers be allowed to retain arms absent criminal prosecution in the states so that they can continue to terrorize their partners. That's what I meant. That meant it when I said it. The Fifth Circuit was correct what they did. And I'm going to stand by that. That's what Justice Clarence Thomas said today. And that should be incredibly alarming, as should it be revealing that the rest of his colleagues from the from the Bruin argument were, were backed off and said, no, we didn't mean that. We didn't mean that. And we're going to manipulate our originalist text and history understanding to get the result we want to make sure that we don't have that kind of optics aimed right at our right at our court. You know, also alarming that uh, Chief Justice Roberts allowed Justice Clarence Thomas to write the bump stock opinion, knowing what Clarence Thomas's views are as it relates to the Rahimi decision. And look, when we do these breakdowns, you and I, we're going to really get, you know, into these areas that are not being covered anywhere else. So, Mike, it's great to have a fellow Georgetown Law alum on this and uh, looking forward to uh, doing more of these hot takes with you. Mike Sachs, senior advisor to court accountability. No one knows the Supreme Court like Mike Sachs and his organization. Thanks for being on. Thanks, Ben. Hit subscribe. Let's get to 3 million subscribers together. Thanks for watching. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.